So welcome back everyone. Um, we're going to start the afternoon session. So we have uh, Ping Wang now um, presenting. So we follow the morning time schedule, 30 minutes, and then five minutes, and then 10 minutes. Okay, I try to be straight with that. Okay, so Ping, um, you can start if you are ready. Um, in this paper, you know, like we kind of address very similar issues. In particular, we are looking at urbanization issues. We are looking at economic development, and the migration is the key. Okay. Uh, in this paper, I do have trade, so similar to Xiaotong's paper. Um, and uh, we are going to emphasize two particular barriers. Uh, there's a, a third barrier, which is not important, only quantitatively important. Okay, so I will talk about that. So this is a joint paper with Rick Bang and the Ray Raisman. So, so essentially, you know, we, we all know this very rapid development in China, but the most interesting part is really like, you know, China had a huge trade barrier, and also because of the hukou system, very big migration barrier. But somehow those two barriers have been reduced, you know, since the middle of uh, 1990s, okay? Uh, faster than the official time of WTO, actually, okay? So because of this environment, and we want to understand, you know, how uh, those kind of reduction in trade and the migration barriers may interact with a number of important uh, ma macro level variables, such as urbanization and the speed of development. Okay, so, so those are the two key issues. We do have structural changes from agriculture to urban and also uh, into different urban sectors, but that's not the emphasis I want to put uh, for this short talk. <coughs> okay, so Everybody knows, you know, like uh, the how how big the rural population is in many uh, nowadays still developing countries, but somehow uh, this rural sur surplus labor is is not easy to compute. There are many different ways to compute it. One way uh, is you know you know just to use kind of estimated uh, surplus labor following the old uh, Harris Todaro uh, type literature, Lewis and the and the Jiang Fei type literature, uh, but in my old paper, we actually used the uh, uh, Chinese New Year uh, sudden increase in the in the long distance uh, uh, train ride, and we used that one to estimate about uh, 25 percent of the rural population could be counted as uh, surplus labor. <coughs> okay, the large urban to rural wage gap. Uh, this this is almost like a, a magic number. This two to one ratio hold largely for like over 10 developing countries, including India and China. Okay, so this is almost like a, a, a magic number there, right? And uh, we didn't see too much wage growth in, you know, uh, within the sample we have studied here, which is before, uh, before the financial crisis. And I don't want to go through the literature, but uh, here I want to uh, quickly talk about this particular paper, okay? So uh, in, in terms of this paper, the main difference from, from the paper you have seen, number one is we actually have two tradable sectors. The two tradable sectors will play a very important role here. And you can always think about you know, like, uh, many different ways, but we prefer the, the con conventional Hesha or Lin way, which is to think about one sector, one particular sector is more like export uh, sector, and, uh, and the other one is import competing sector. If the country is like at a low level of development, you would think this import competing sector is going to be more skilled and uh, capital intensive. And uh, we are going to prove this is the case in, you know, based upon the data also. So we have two tradable sectors there. And then we have abundant supply of labor from the, from the, from the, from the rural area. And we'll consider mi migration equilibrium. So we will have skilled, unskilled labor. And the two sectors are going to be emphasized here. Oops, not movable. Any, oh, okay. <clears throat> and uh, in terms of both trade and the migration, we'll have the barriers measured. Okay. So in terms of trade, trade barriers, we are going to use only one measure, which is the import tariff. And the mi migration is going to be a, a, a wedger. Based upon the migration equilibrium, we'll compute the wedger, which is more like a utility gap. Okay, and then, then, then we are going to compute the, uh, the migration barrier, uh, you know, kind of backward. 
So the issue is, uh, when we have this tree liberalization going in the WTO, and we also have this migration constraint uh, relaxation, uh, you know, since Deng Xiaoping's uh, South Trip. So there's a first wave of uh, relaxation of the hukou system, 94, uh, 95, and then there's a second wave, more like you know, 2002, 2003, basically. So, so we want to see how this may change capital accumulation and uh, may also change the location of capital and the unskilled labor to different sectors. So this is going to be the key, okay? And then through these changes, the aggregate implication can be produced, okay? Then to, in order to produce any aggregate implication in terms of overall urbanization process and, uh, and the speed of economic development, we need some conditions. And we are going to establish some uh, uh, crucial conditions which will not be surprising to trade people because they are all factor intensity type ranking type assumptions, okay? So later you will see, you know, we'll have like uh, two set of conditions and which will guarantee, you know, some uh, aggregate result, okay? And then we calibrate to the, to the China economy to feed to the uh, pre-financial tsunami period since 1980, okay? And we'll divide the whole period into three different regions. You know, we don't have enough data to really look at annual variations. So this is why we prefer to use like three regimes to capture the changes, okay? So I don't think I have time to talk about the main findings. So why don't I talk about the total, uh, you know, the, the very, very baseline model here, okay? So we'll have, you know, like uh, labor as the central part of the uh, players. So we'll have uh, stock of unskilled labor denoted by N bar. And uh, this will have like N in the rural area and the L in the, uh, in the urban area. When we put to the calibration analysis, we are going to have population growth. Population growth of this N bar. <coughs> rural sector is very simple. It's just non-traded backyard farming. And uh, the subsistence utility level would be like U bar. Urban sector, as mentioned, will have two tradable goods. The, the import competing goods is called Y, okay, which will use uh, unskilled, skilled, and also capital. And for simplicity, which can be generalized, the exporting uh, sector will be using only unskilled labor and capital without, without skilled. Okay. And the migration will basically say if you have, so, so basically in this paper, we ignore high, high education migration. Okay, I, I, I do have another paper joining with Yin Qi and the other people, you know, talking about education-based migration. But this paper is not. This paper, whenever we say migration, by the Ch Chinese definition, it is no mean gong. <laughs> okay, so no mean gong is unskilled migration, basically. Okay, when we use the data, we also use, you know, like, you know, no mean gong flows, okay. So, so this is totally unskilled migration. So migration basically implies, you know, this, any particular worker will feel being indifferent in the two, two area, basically, okay? And the tariff uh, tau will be added to the, to the numerator goods, which is the import competing goods, and hence the price will, will become one, one plus tau there. And uh, if you have the wage rate divided by the, uh, by the relative price, then, then basically the unskilled consumption can be derived very easily, okay? And uh, so you can derive the utility and then you can derive the migration equilibrium. So it's very simple. But the important message is what? What this basically tell you, essentially, you have, a, you have this outside option to stay in rural. You have this uh, unskilled utility from moving to city area, so it's, which is increasing but really concave in wage. So the equilibrium will be pinned down at a particular number here. So this basically tell you the classic two sector hash only model will not work anymore. Okay? Because migration equilibrium pin down the unskilled wage. Okay. <coughs> and uh, for skilled, you, you know, they will own the capital. So they have both capital income and the skilled wage denoted by S. This is the real wage income and the real rental income plus any kind of transfer, okay? And uh, it's 
you know, this can be used for both consumption purposes and the investment purposes. Capital can be accumulated using a standard equation except for this mu. Pretending this mu is one, right? This is absolutely standard, right? This is like undepreciated part of previous capital stock plus new investment should be equal to the new capital stock. So what is mu? Well, if mu is a constant, then we have the parenti Prisca set up. If mu is a constant greater than one, you can view that one as the barrier to, uh, to growth parameter in parenti Prisca. Okay. But we assume this mu is not just a function of, uh, you know, not just a constant greater than one, but a function of investment. So this basically kind of captures both the barriers uh, model of parenti Prisca and also some kind of adjustment cost model. Okay, but different from the adjustment cost model. You know, the, later we are going to assume this is an isoelastic function, and uh, then everything can be solved very easily. So it's much more user friendly than the adjustment cost model. Okay. <clears throat> we can derive modified golden rule, which will depend on this guy. And then uh, we deviate from the standard type analysis, which always focus on the primals. In this paper, we focus on the dual. The deal is much easier. Think about unskilled wage rate is pinned down by migration equilibrium, right? Now, from the unit cost function of the export sector, which will only depend on the factor prices of capital rental and the unskilled wage rate, and because you know, we have small open assumption, so the price is fixed there, so this immediately pinned down the capital rental. Now, from the unit cost function of the import competing goods, then we can pin down the skill wage rate. So everything can be pinned down very easily. Okay. You, can, you can see if we allow skill to enter into both sectors, then you, you have a two by two sub hexa or lean sector there. Everything can be pinned down two by two also, which is not going to change the result by much. Okay. So basically the skill is going to be assumed to be uh, uh, you know, more complement to capital than the unskilled basically. So this is the only assumption we have imposed, which is true actually. Uh, just one quick notation, the TFP of the import competing sector is called A, and the that's of uh, the, the exporting sector is called B. And the la later, we'll calibrate those numbers to the data, and the, you might be a little bit surprised by the result. Okay. So as I mentioned, we use the uh, three equations. Uh, we have already solved the, uh, the factor prices. Then we, then we can use you know, you know, Shepard's lemma, and then, then, then we can just solve all the conditional demands, and uh, then we can solve both uh, output and uh, the urban labor. Okay. This capital can be pinned down by the modified golden rule equation already. Okay. So everything becomes very, very user friendly. I don't want to go through any of the detailed result, but let me just show you we close the model and uh, the key thing, you know, I'm not going to talk about skill premium either, but the key thing is I'm going to talk about is we will have this main result here. Uh, first result is in terms of sectoral output, it's not surprising, right? If you reduce import tariff, you are going to be more in favor of, uh, you know, um, you know uh, because you have reduced, you, you reduce the protection to the import competing sector. So, so it's going to be more in favor of the exporting sector and, uh, and uh, it's going to hurt the import competing sector. So, so this is still similar to the hash all in predictions. Okay, so this is the sectoral uh, changes between the two sectors. But the interesting part is what if you, you think about the aggregate? The aggregate will turn out to depend on two conditions. In terms of tariff, Everything depends on whether import competing sector is uh, capital intensive in the quantity sense. So we can define capital intensity in terms of capital labor ratio. We can also define uh, you know, capital intensity in terms of the cost share. Okay? So if we use the capital labor ratio, which is quantity definition, assuming import competing sector is capital intensive, which is true in the data, then a uh, reduction in import tariff will speed up urbanization process. 
but we need one more assumption. Not just quantity, but also in cost sense. If both turns out to be uh, pointing to a more capital intensive import competing sector, then reduction in migration barrier will promote urbanization. So we need one more assumption there. And uh, of course, based upon the data, it's turned out to be the case. Okay? But theoretically, those two conditions are, are crucial to pin down any aggregated result. Now in terms of real GDP growth, is very similar. Okay, so in terms of tariff result, tariff reduction will promote real GDP if we have capital uh, intensity associated with the import competing sector. And if it's, it is true in both quantity and the cost sense, then reduction in migration barriers will also promote real GDP. So now how important they are is totally quantitative. <coughs> so we are going to uh, calibrate to match with sectoral TFP population growth, and uh, will allow for the service sector to, to be there. So far, we don't have a service sector. But we allow service sector to be a proportion to the manufacturing sector. But, th but this proportion may change across different regions. Okay? And then we look at the three different regions. Region 1 is going to be the early region, which are in high tariff and a very restrictive hookah system. The second regime is, you know, we begin to see the reduction in tariff and, the, and, the, and the in migration barriers already. This is even before joining the, the WTO, okay? Then we have seen this reduction already. Then the third region, joining WTO, and we have more relaxation of the, the migration regulation, in particular the blue stamp type, okay? And then also the, the skill expansion, which is due to the college admission uh, rate increase starting in 1999. Yes, unfortunately. Those are identical. Identical proportions. That's right. But the size of the service sector is, uh, is, is allowed to be, to be increased over time. How does HUCO interact with this? Uh, not at all, no. So you can always go into uh, HUCO interact with the whole urban area identically. It so doesn't matter whether it is manufacturer or... Urban and rural, you have two service sectors. Uh, so, but, but the service in the, in the, in the rural sector can, can, can be just called you know, you know, self-employment. So, so that wouldn't matter there. So we only match the urban fraction of the service sector in the data. So now things come to setting up the functional phones, right? And uh, I believe nobody would be surprised if we said production functions are both coplas. Everyone should be happy, okay. Now, utility function, you may not be as happy, but I wouldn't mind, just to assume to be log-linear, okay? So the only thing left is this mu function, right? This capital barrier type stuff. So we are going to set this as an isoelastic form, okay? And then, how big is this epsilon will be related to the cattle barrier? This is crucial in terms of calibration. This is not crucial in terms of our main result. Because in the calibration, we have to find an easy way to match with the 20% cattle return. Which is not too, too simple, right? There are many ways to, to do it. One way to do it is to, to assume some kind of uh, stay-on enterprise sector, okay? And uh, there, are, there are also other ways to do it. But the easiest way to us is to consider this mu, and this mu will give us uh, exact match of the 20% uh, capital rental, okay? Uh, remember, this is during the period between 19, uh, 1980 and uh, 2008. Based upon the newest data available, uh, Michael Song claimed you know, you know, this capital return could be as low as like 13% nowadays, okay? So, but during our simple period, 20% is the best uh, believable data, basically. Okay, so we are going to calibrate to match discount rate. I know people have, you know, including people in the room, you know, have argued sometimes China should be very low, maybe like one percent. I also have seen other people claim to be five percent. So we are kind of coward. We say, okay, we go to the middle, three percent. 
but that's what we have. Okay, capital depreciation rate standard. And uh, we can always, always normalize some variables because they are population units. So we are normalizing skilled labor unit to be one. And hence our population will have a number, okay? It, the total population is no longer one. The, the main reason is I don't want to carry a skilled labor number which is a point in all something, right? <laughs> which is, you know, you, you will carry a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like uh, R number there, you know, you, you know which will, will looks very ugly in, in tables, basically. And the reservation value is normalized to one. You know, this is by normalizing the value also. And we set this uh, urban rural wage ratio to be two, which is roughly consistent with the channel data too. Yes. The, you mean this two? Uh, this two, if you average the data, between uh, 1980 and, uh, and uh, 2008, and uh, you, you, you use rural income. Rural is no wage data. Use rural income, and uh, then use uh, urban wage income. Okay, and then you assume the rural area is like there's a fraction, one third to land, two third to, to, to wage. Then, then, the, then the ratio, wage ratio is roughly about two. It's by assumption. If we assume you know it's like fifty percent to land, you know then then that will be like about two point five ish, two point four, two point five. Yeah. But only we only look at those with uh, less than uh, nine year or less education. But based upon those categories, the wage rate is not as much higher. Yeah, only only two to two point five, no more than two point five, depending on how much you you assume the land share of rural income is. So in your assumption, it's fifty fifty, right? Oh, you have the land too. That's right, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, so, so that's two is considered. Okay, good, okay, that's good, all right. And how, over the entire period, the average is about 15%, you know. This is very dumb average. Don't, don't, don't take this one seriously. There's no weighted average. It's just simple average, okay. Uh, skill premium, average is 1.55, okay. And uh, in terms of the unskilled labor share to the exporting sector is almost 60%. Capital share is like you know only forty five percent. Okay, so you so you can see the capital intensity already, right? And then the growth rate of uh, import competing uh, sector is slower than the exporting sector, which is probably not not too surprising, but, but you know but but differ by that much that's a little bit surprising. Right? Okay, so this is all from data, and we are going to match with the data there. Aggregate, aggregate, annual, annual growth rate. And, you know, this is computed from the data. We, we aggregate all the, all the different sectors and then compute the growth rate. So, so, so just keep in mind, you know, the, the growth rate of the manufacturing sector, in order to look at the, the urban sectors, you have to aggregate from, from different subsectors. It's a big, it's a big job there actually. So, uh, number one, we need to talk about which sector will have how much import content and how much export content, and we have the data there. And then we have like about two, two, two digit subsectors. Then we distribute using employment shares of the import content, export content. It's TFP, TFP. Capital is growing, labor, you know, labor force is growing. Yeah. But, but don't forget about one, one crucial thing. If, if you aggregate, if you aggregate from sectors, you never match with aggregate. If you aggregate from sectors, you never match with aggregate. This is very typical China data. More than that. China data does not aggregate up. 
Yeah. Are you yeah. We shouldn't trust this data? No, no, you should trust this. This is, this is aggregated from subsectors. I mean, you should not trust aggregate data by that much, okay? You will never aggregate up to, to, to 10 percent. You know, Sheldon may have different views, but you know, like, I, 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 my own experience is if I aggregate from subsectors, there are also some Chinese scholars saying the same thing. If you aggregate from all the industries, you will have some growth rate which is not nearly close, right? Now you will say, can survey sector grow by that much? Can agricultural survey you know, sector grow by that much? The answer is probably not. But this is from two-digit industry aggregate up. And I trust this one more, basically. OK. Uh, then we have to calibrate everything to, to meet. So, so we calibrate everything. And uh, I'm not going to talk about the details, so the production parameters and uh, a lot of other things. Okay. And then we consider the three different regimes. But the most important thing is, in the early regime, you can see the tariff rate is almost one third. The effective tariff rate is almost one third, okay? And the hook system is very restrictive, okay? And the skill labor is very low. Population, you know, population is by, you know, by normalizing the skill to be one, then how much this will be, basically. The initial, uh, sorry, when I say the one, the one is not initial. The one is actually the average of the entire period. When that is normalized to be one, how much the population should be, we, you know, which is by, by data, right? And then we have the survey sector share, about 17%. And then finally, the AB ratio, the import competing sector TFP to the, to the uh, exporting sector ratio is 1.06. So, you can see at the early regime, still import competing sector is more productive, but later it's turned upside down. You know, on point, point nine two already. Okay, survey share expanded, population growing, and the uh, skill growing, but not by that much. Uh, oh no, sorry, skill is st st still the same. Okay, about relaxation of the hook system and the reduction in the in the tariff rate. And then further reduction to like about below 6% already. And then uh, further reduction in the hookah system. Skill expanded a lot because of the college admission, uh, relaxation, population grow slower, but you know, still grow. And the survey sector grow to like about more than one third. Okay, AB ratio keep reducing. So this is all the calibrated result. So I just want to quickly show you uh, how we do the counterfactual analysis. We look at the region two, right? Then we say, suppose we restore one by one each parameters back to region one. Let's see what happened. Okay, so, so this is the result. Then we do counterfactual uh, two. We restore region three stuff one by one to region two, and then see what happened. So this is counterfactual, very simple. Okay, so remember, this is a highly nonlinear model. So suppose we have three factors, although we don't have three, we have like five, you know, five factors. So we do have each individual ones, we also have interactions. But by counterfactual, I take out one, I actually take out not the, indi the individual variance, I also take out any covariance with this particular factor, okay? So this is the, the counterfactual analysis. So let me just show you the, uh, the decomposition. So the decomposition basically says from region one to region two. So this is across 1995, uh, 1995 okay? Across 1995. Tariff reduction, you know, essentially doesn't matter, right? It's only account about 8% of the real GDP growth change. Only about 8%, not much. Migration cost reduction counted a lot, more than 60%. TFP, Changes accounted for about thirty percent. So it's all coming from migration costs and the and the and the TFP in the early stage, moving from region one to region two, namely uh, before ninety five and after ninety five, both before the WTO. Okay. Now in terms of output share, tariff can explain about twenty percent, which is not bad. Okay. Still, migration cost is very important. TFP is very important. You won't be surprised when surveys expand and the population is increasing, 
you know, the uh, rural population, you know, rural has larger shear there, so the so the urban shear will be smaller, basically. Okay, so so this is why they compute. You know, those two factors sum up, you know, to like about minus something percent. Okay. Now, in terms of urban employment share, this is the only part you can see tariff reduction, trade liberalization is crucial. But don't forget, this is from region one to region two, which means from 1980 to 94, to 95 to 2000, to 2000, zero minutes, okay, <laughs> to, to 2002, okay. So this is before the WTO. After joining WTO, tariff is just not, not important at all. Okay, so since I have zero minutes, I would better move to the takeaways. So what I want to say is very uh, simple. If you think about how important are those reduction the barriers, well, trade barriers is crucial only in the early stage, not to GDP growth, not to real GDP growth, but most importantly to the urban employment increase. And to some degree, it's also important to the urban uh, output share. Okay, uh, in terms of the real GDP growth, it is really migration and the skill expansion which play the most important role. Thank you. Um, on the program, the discussion. Oh. All right. Um, so I'm going to discuss the paper. The discussion has been changed. So, um, so this is a very nice paper. Uh, I enjoy reading the paper. It's quite nice. The paper actually does a very detailed analysis of. Um, detailed and rigorous analysis of uh, comparative statics, which uh, hasn't been mentioned in the talk too much. Um, so let me uh, summarize the paper. The research questions that this paper asks is what drives economic growth and urbanization? And specifically, there are two um, barriers that the paper talks about. The first barrier is trade barrier. The second barrier is migration barrier. So the paper asks, um, so what are the roles of the reduction in these barriers. So the results here uh, are quite interesting. So the primary drivers of per capita GDP growth is migration cost reduction and skill accumulation, among other forces. So other forces include uh, tariff reduction, TFP changes, population slowdown, and service expansion. So here's the summary of the model. So the model, have two, uh, the model has two sectors, the rural sector and the urban sector. So rural sector has unskilled labor, and urban sector has um, unskilled labor, skilled labor, and capital. So it produces two things, two kinds of things. The first kind of thing is exportable. The second kind of thing is importable. Exportable X uses uh, capital and unskilled labor, and importable um, the production of importable uses uh, capital on skilled labor and skilled labor. And the paper wants to address uh, the, um, the effect of the reduction of two barriers, import tariff and migration cost. So my takeaway or my, my understanding of this model is that, um, so if we think, so because export sector is using capital and on skilled labor. And the only difference between imports, importable and exportable is that it uses skilled labor. So if we think about about um, capital and unskilled labor as a bundle. And then when there's a reduction in import tariff, or if there's a reduction in migration cost, that amounts to a reduction in the input bundle, in the cost of the input bundle. Because ex exportable is using this bundle intensively, because importable is using skilled labor, so which means it's not using that bundle very in as intensively as exportable. So when there's a reduction in the cost of this bundle, then this sector is going to expand. So that's the, uh, I think, the, my understanding of the result. So um, I have two comments about this paper. So comment one is about the modeling of growth and development um, as transitions among three steady states. So the key question this paper tries to answer is, what is the contribution of each factor to the transition from one steady state to another steady state? The paper considers three steady states, regime one, two, and three. So what the paper does is, so let's take the tariff reduction uh, from regime two to regime three as an example. So um, in regime three, uh, tariff is low. And what the paper does is, let's see when we change um, the tariff to its regime two value, okay? In regime two, it's 
medium, and now let's change it to medium. I'm sorry, this is typo here. I wrote it as high. So, um, in fact, uh, my understanding of this um, type of exercise is that it's considering the deviation from regime three steady state. So, because when we consider regime three, we only change the tariff to regime two value, holding other policies as at their value in regime three. So this is like a deviation from steady state uh, from regime three steady state. Uh, yeah, the paper tries to answer the uh, the contribution of each factor to the transition from steady state two to steady state three. But this exercise is mainly a deviation from steady, th uh, steady state three. So I'm not trying, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, quite convinced that, that this type of exercise is gonna answer the transition. Um, the second comment that I have is one assumption in the quantitative analysis is that U bar is fixed. U bar is the utility value in rural areas. And because U bar pins down the wage of unskilled laborers, and suppose U bar, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, U bar can change over time. Suppose that rural income doubles in 30 years, and U bar increases, and that's going to counteract some of the effect of tariff reduction and reduction in migration cost. But you see here, the T here is the tariff. So if you reduce tariff, but U bar increases value of staying in rural areas increases, that's gonna counteract some of the effect of um, tariff, tariff reduction and also reduction in migration cost. So my concern is that uh, will this result, will the result change qual qualitatively and quantitatively if we consider that uh, even in rural areas that um, the living standard has also increased. So that's mainly my comment. So, um, Summarize this is very inspiring paper, very nice paper. I enjoyed quite a lot, and perhaps there should be more details regarding the transition. So I, I don't fully uh, get um, how, we, how, how the authors uh, got this transition result by considering deviation from steady state. Um, and uh, perhaps more robustness checks on assumptions about the rural sector, because rural sector, although it's not growing as fast as urban sector, it certainly has, um, living standard and certainly has increased. So maybe some robustness, robustness checks on this. Thank you. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> uh, yeah, so actually, so, um, yeah, That so, was a joke. So let's take some questions. <laughs> okay, so shall we take some questions from the back? Yeah, so one, let me just gather to see how many questions. One, two, okay. Yeah, so why don't, and then, and then um, Pin can uh, respond sure. together. How to map the dependence to the, and to the, to the model. If you look at China's foreign trade sector, imports and exports, a major portion of China's, a major portion of China's imports over this period of time are coming in duty free. You know, so they have this export processing regime and so over the course of the last 15 or 20 years, 55, 60 percent of China's exports have been processing exports that were allowed to import intermediate goods duty free as long as they went back out in the form of exports. So there's this question then about how do we try to kind of capture when we're trying to put down this kind of export regime, exports and imports. And the same thing with respect to imports. Most of the imports that are coming in, or at least more than half of them, are going into these exports that are re exported you know, in that regard. So it's just trying to kind of capture these kind of unique institutional features of China's export regime, the fact that lots of goods are coming in duty free as long as they're exported, which is itself maybe a distortion in the economy. How do we you know, try to capture that institutionally and then so it kind of fits the model a bit better? Mine is, it, it's completely unrelated, but it's very close to what the discussion was saying. That's why, which I re really like your discussion, by the way. <laughs> which is, um, what, how, how does the rural sec sector growth? I mean, like if you if you plot if you plot productivity growth in rural and, uh, and urban areas, they've been more or less the same at the same rates throughout the uh, period that you're studying. In fact, it's one of the astonishing things about 
that I find about uh, Chinese uh, economic development that um, that it didn't come, you know, usually you get a faster growth in agriculture, a kind of green revolution that releases labor that goes into the urban sector. But in fact, in China, the growth rates have been more or less constant except for two episodes. I think I think someone here actually wrote about that. I thought it's pretty, it's, but pro, yeah, probably uh, Shandong. But, uh, but you're modeling exactly the reverse of what we normally observe. So no, which is the point that this discussion made, in fact, that, that there's no growth in the rural sector. And there is only in the urban. You know what I mean by rural and urban, I mean. And, and, and also the question that, um, about this intensity and the what you said is a material assumption about the um, difference in production functions, where the import substitution uses skilled and the other doesn't. I, th I also think it's rather striking and drives the results, and is much more than a simplifying assumption. I can. Okay, so so let me go through the questions uh, in a backward way. Okay, so the the import sector uh, in our early version we have actually skilled in the import competing sector. All we need is the uh, import competing sector is more skill intensive. Okay. That's complicated things. It really doesn't matter that much quantitatively. The the main result in terms of how important is the tariff reduction still still you know seems to be totally true basically it will change the relative a b ratio but uh, still a b ratio is declining basically so so that part is just uh, for 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 simplification that part is not important rural growth uh, again earlier we do have u bar to grow and we do allow u bar to grow at agricultural tfp rate Okay, but everything is you know is up to the relative sense. So so that will not change things. So the most important thing is relative. So think about all we need here are three quality three qualitative true statements. One is import competing sector is relatively more skill intensive and capital intensive. Okay, so that's number one. And number two, urban will earn higher wage rate, and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, number three urban will have more skilled people. So if we do have those three, anything else is just to fit to the data and everything's relative, really. Okay. So, so those are three very important things. Uh, back to Lauren's question. Uh, in order to do that, I think that's very important, but I, I think we need both intermediate goods sector and the final goods sector. Uh, I do have a paper like that, but uh, uh, that's a totally different paper. It's very complicated indeed. Uh, and uh, if you if you have the standard simple variety models, it will not work. Okay, in terms of China, because the markup changed by a lot, you need a variable markup model. So th so that's what my 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 other paper is. Uh, it's very complicated. Uh, I, I I found out exactly the same thing in my other paper there, you know. So, but um, in terms of aggregate impact, how much does impact will be, you know, uh, you know, you know, it's yet to 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 be determined. You know, I I don't want to expect it, you know. I don't want to put any speculation there, basically. So 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 that's a very different type of model. And then finally, uh, maybe there's a language issue here uh, to the discussion, basically. So. Uh, I keep talking about counterfactuals, counterfactuals. There's no, no I, I don't talk about transitions. From region one to region two to, to region three, there's no transitions. So everything is by counterfactuals. So all the analysis there is counterfactual. There's no, no dynamic transition. Okay, so so capital goods uh, is produced, you know, like in the urban sector, which is going to be import uh, import competing, only import competing. Based upon the data, it's more like more more than eighty percent will be 
from front house setter. Uh, investment specific technical. Uh, yeah, but, but uh, so so the meal stuff is to guarantee the the return is twenty percent capital rent. Yeah, it, it doesn't change. Yeah. 